Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the second day of the uh, Eurozone Crisis, Greece, and the Experience of Austerity uh, Conference. It's a conference organized by the Levy, uh, Levy, Levy Economics Institute of Bard College with support uh, from the Ford Foundation. It is the Minsky uh, Conference. I am Michalis Panagiotakis, a journalist for the Daily Avigi. And uh, uh, given that this is the Minsky Conference, and Minsky is already in Athens in a sense, uh, and his spirit was probably slightly offended at least by, uh, the, uh, by Eve Mercer's speech uh, last night, uh, we will try to placate his spirit today. Our speakers today are Robert Parenteau <coughs> and Jörg Bibo, uh, and they, we will be talking about the European Union and its policies of austerity and the prospects of growth. The title is, of course, a union of austerity or a union of growth. Uh, and originally, uh, the, originally, one of the speakers was supposed to be Lex Hauchdown, uh, who is a professor at economics at the University of Amsterdam, uh, but unfortunately he couldn't attend. Uh, so uh, let's start. I'm, I'll, uh, uh, Robert Parenteau is a research associate at the Levy Institute and sole proprietor of the <coughs> macro, of mac macro Strategy Edge. Uh, please. Okay, thank you for rolling out of bed on an early Saturday morning. Thank you. I'm going to talk about the austerity trap and uh, suggest a, way, a few ways to exit it without exiting the euro. Uh, we've been told by the ECB, by the Troika, um, by your own politicians that there is no alternative to austerity, um, and I'm going to try and show you why that may not be the case and uh, give you some ideas about possible ways to uh, get out of austerity without exiting the euro. To do this, I'm going to take a look at five key perspectives, uh, one that I call the ultimate design flaw of the eurozone, uh, namely the fatal conceit of neoliberalism. Um, I think there was a calculated misdiagnosis of the crisis, and that's related to this fatal conceit. Um, I want to talk briefly about the myth of expansionary fiscal consolidations, which we no longer hear mentioned, but was one of the justifications for austerity policies. And then, uh, most importantly, I want to use a coherent stock flow macroeconomic approach, one that's central to much of the work that the Levy Institute does and when Godley was instrumental in, in pushing forward to reveal some of the aspects of the austerity trap that don't seem to be well appreciated or understood uh, by policy officials or by investors, even though it's based on simple principles of double entry bookkeeping that have been around for seven centuries now. So it's not high theory by any stretch of the imagination. And then I'll close uh, briefly with three modest proposals to suggest ways of exiting austerity without exiting the euro. Um, we've talked about many of the design flaws in the eurozone, and I won't belabor this point. Um, but there's a number of them that keep coming up. We've um, discussed some of them yesterday. One is it may not be an optimal currency area. There seem to be differential um, responses across economies to various shocks. Um, we're submitting various countries to a one-size-fits-all monetary policy, which may not be appropriate. We've created an economic union without a political union. This is very unusual in history, and usually they don't last very long. Um, we created a system where there were weak and, I would argue, contradictory mechanisms to try and adjust trade imbalances. Uh, in particular, we've replaced competitive depreciations of currencies with what now seem to be competitive deflations in wages. That means inflation um, rates will have differentials, and that means real interest rates will be differential across countries. And so the convergence of inflation rates, which was supposedly one of the aspects of the Eurozone, is not consistent with uh, the, the trade balance um, adjustment mechanism. And we also had constrained fiscal policy, as, as uh, Randy and Jan pointed out yesterday. Uh, countries' fiscal authorities are now users but not issuers of currencies, and that makes a hell of a lot of difference in terms of the default risk 
of, of, the, uh, of the, the liabilities that those units are issuing here. These are just some of the many design flaws. We could have a whole symposium on that. Um, people in this room have written papers suggesting these design flaws before the Eurozone was implemented, but this made no difference, and it was as much a political project as, a, as an economic project. Um, what I want to uh, talk about is uh, what I think is the fatal the ultimate fatal design flaw of the Eurozone. And I'm calling it, um, with all uh, undue respect to Frederick von Hayek, the fatal conceit of neoliberal economics because he thought there was a fatal conceit to socialist planning. Um, and what I think this is, as we heard yesterday um, from one of the speakers who was instrumental in uh, forming the Maastricht Treaty, is that there's this strong belief, it's almost a faith-based belief, that changes in relative prices will always guide economies back to a full employment growth path. And because of this faith that we have in relative price changes to drive economies back on full employment, we have to get rid of all these policy tools that just interfere with relative price adjustments. So in the Eurozone, each country itself has no foreign exchange control. We gave up that instrument of policy influence. We diluted the ability to influence monetary policy. You have a vote on the ECB, but that's all that you have. It's not under your determination. And we restricted fiscal stimulus for each country. All of these, I think, were underlying, informed by this idea that markets will self-adjust and they will self-adjust to full employment. So you want to get all these ways of cheating and all these ways of influencing relative prices out of the way so you can have markets do what they do best. Uh, in fact, um, we know from theory, whether it's Irving Fisher, who was a confirmed and devout believer in equilibrium theory, but had to lose his fortune in his house to rethink things, um, or Keynes, or High Minsky, that uh, these price adjustments, in fact, can often lead economies away from full employment, not closer to full employment growth paths. And in particular, Keynes would emphasize, uh, and we could again do a whole symposium on this, that the price signals that are required to lead to full employment are either weak, unreliable, or unbounded. And he would talk a lot about the uncertainty, not just the risk of future events. And the whole chapter 12 of the general theory is a critique of the asset price formation in marketplaces and how it can be informed by uh, gaming, basically, gaming of investors of each other. And there were problems with a zero nominal yield bond and bound and also liquidity preferences that would stop interest rates from falling before you hit that zero nominal yield. So there are a variety of reasons to think that you weren't going to head towards full employment growth, just letting markets uh, self-adjust. But worse yet, um, it was clear that if you got downward price adjustments, these could create cumulative uh, debt deflation dynamics, especially where you had private debt loads that were very high. And this could be self-reinforcing with falling asset prices and falling incomes uh, being part of the process, something you should now be intimately familiar with. And this could, in turn, threaten social disintegration. You could lose capitalism to other forms of, of, uh, of uh, economic organization. You could have political discord. Uh, it would fray the social fabric, in other words. And history, not just theory, has painfully, obviously, and repeatedly concurred with this point of view. And so we have a Eurozone based on a point of view that theoretically doesn't hold up and historically hasn't held up. So this, I think, is the ultimate design flaw behind the Eurozone. Um, I think because there is this faith-based economics and market self-adjusting to full employment through relative prices, there was also this need to come up with this calculated misdiagnosis of the crisis. So neoliberals, we know, blame the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008 on fiscal deficits and public debt profligacy. As we saw yesterday, in fact, the profligacy was more on the private sector side. Private sectors can deficit spend, and deficit spending that's accumulated over time shows up as usually debt on the balance sheet. And we saw uh, empirically, and I won't run through these charts again, yesterday that there was evidence of a large buildup of deficit spending and debt on the Eurozone household and uh, 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 firm, non-financial firm balance sheets. These were also the sectors with the highest debt to income ratios. And these were also uh, the sectors where there were the largest increases in the debt to income ratios in many cases. And yet we never hear anything about the sustainability 
of private debts and private deficit spending. We only hear about sustainability issues when it comes to public debt. And I think if we look at why the economic contraction was so deep and so prolonged, it has everything to do with this private sector spending in excess of its income growth and retrenching that spending and retrenching its borrowing as we went into the recession. And Richard Koo talks about this as a balance sheet recession, which is essentially a watered down version of what Minsky and Keynes and Fisher were talking about with these debt deflation cycles. So what we see, in fact, is that these large fiscal deficits were rather a passive response to the falling private spending and to the, falling, the failing private debt. And so these fiscal deficits were more an outcome of the GFC than a cause. And it's a darn good thing fiscal deficits did explode, because otherwise nominal income would have been falling sooner, and we would have gone right into the debt deflation cycle in 2008, 2009. So what we've noticed here in this example and in prior examples is that this asymmetric response or this blind spot that policymakers and investors seem to have when it comes to public and private sector deficit spending. They recognize public sector deficit spending as a risk, but not private sector deficit spending. And I think, again, this has a lot to do with this fatal conceit of neoliberalism, the private sector uh, being profit maximizing and utility maximizing, never gets it wrong or rarely gets it wrong for too long. Markets always get it right. So there can't be an irrational or dangerous level of debt or deficit build, spending that builds up on household balance sheets or on non-financial corporate balance sheets. This is always a rational calculation, and markets are always um, pricing in the correct information in a very timely fashion. So I think we can see now why fiscal deficits were blamed for the crisis and why this is a misdiagnosis of the crisis. Um, so I think this causes a real problem in terms of uh, finding solutions. If you don't have the right diagnosis, you can't come up with the right uh, remedy. We do know um, that they then moved on to the story about expansionary fiscal consolidations to uh, encourage countries to adopt austerity policies, to uh, cut back on public spending, and to increase public uh, taxes. And it is, in fact, possible we can find historical examples where economic growth does occur while fiscal consolidation is going on. Canada in the mid-90s is one example that's frequently cited. But they forgot to mention that this type of uh, situation, this expansionary fiscal consolidation, is possible only under very special conditions. And I can't imagine why they forgot to mention that. But um, there's two conditions, I think, at least, that we can identify that need to occur for an expansionary fiscal consolidation to take place. One is interest rates have to fall dramatically enough as you reduce the fiscal deficit to drive up private spending, particularly on interest sensitive areas like capital spending, housing, and consumer durable goods. And uh, in fact, the interest rate sensitivity of some of these things may not be that high. And in fact, there's not a good correlation between interest rates and deficits that we find historically. Often there's a recession, deficits go up, and interest rates go down. And so uh, it's not as clear that this is as is a, a hard and fast rule, but it is a required condition to get an expansionary financial consolidation to work. Or you've got to have the exchange rate falling dramatically enough that your balance of trade improves, that your exports increase and your imports reduce. But this is only going to work, and it will work best for small open economies like Canada, like some of the Nordic uh, countries, because if you're too big a country, you're going to get into a beggar thy neighbor war with your trading partners, and they will claim foul and try to competitively uh, depreciate their exchange rates as well. Um, we know in the Eurozone, by design, neither the interest rate or exchange rate decision belongs to an individual country. Um, and so these conditions required to make an expansionary fiscal consolidation happen, to make it uh, possible, certainly did not apply to the Eurozone. So why were they telling the story in the first place? Uh, obviously, there was an agenda here. Um, this takes us to where we stand now. And many of these economies were stuck in what I call, and other people call, an austerity trap, whereby the increases in taxes and the cuts in government spending are eroding business and household income flows. That means the private sector is less able to service its debt. That means that bank loan losses will rise, and often those bank uh, losses have to be socialized by the public sector. Uh, 
And as the private sector reduces its spending and cuts its leverage, GDP growth falls, or worse yet, as we've had in Greece, the level of GDP will actually decline both in real and in nominal terms. And that in turn means that the tax revenues end up coming up short, and the expenditure cuts come up light, and the fiscal targets are missed, and the public debt to GDP ratio target is missed because the denominator is shrinking faster than the, the, the uh, numerator, which is, in fact is still expanding. And the rating agencies see this process and they say, we need to downgrade this debt because income growth is falling and tax revenues are, are coming short. And so you get into a larger problem because interest rates then go up and you have a higher interest expense on your public debt. And then the Troika comes in and says, you need to raise taxes more, and you need to cut government spending more to get to these fiscal targets, and around and around and around we go. And uh, this is the nature of the austerity trap that many of these countries are in, inclu including this one. I think we can use uh, a more coherent macroeconomics than we find amongst policymakers and investors, uh, a, co a coherent stock flow. Uh, macroeconomics that um, uses this financial balance approach to try and understand part of the reason why we're stuck in these austerity traps. And uh, Dimitri later will uh, uh, discuss some of the scenarios for Greece that are uh, based on this approach. And so it's good to have some familiarity with it. And we uh, at the Levy Institute are so familiar with it that we don't always explain what's going on. But let me try and lay it out in some very simple um, ways of approaching it. Uh, both algebraically and grammatically so that you can get a feel for this. Let's divide the economy into three sectors, the government, the foreign, which we would call the foreign financial balance, and that's the inverse of the current account balance, is looking at it from the foreigner's point of view, and the domestic private sector, which is just the household and business side, which I'll call DPSFB for short, domestic private sector financial balance. For each of these sectors, we can define a financial sector financial balance that's simply the income of the sector minus the expenditures of the sector, or we could also do this in savings and investment terms, but it's often easier to do it in, in income and expenditure terms. Um, for any one sector, there's three different states this financial balance can be. It can be in surplus, when income is greater than expenditures or saving is greater than investment. In other words, we have net saving going on within the sector. And that allows the sector to accumulate financial assets or pay down debt. We can have a neutral situation where income is exactly equal to expenditures, as in a balanced fiscal budget, and savings is exactly equal to investment. Or we can have a deficit condition where income is less than expenditures and saving is less than investment. And in this case, the sector has to issue financial liabilities and sell assets. And so the way these flows accumulate over time in stocks, obviously, is a deficit spending sector that continues to deficit spend will end up leveraging its balance sheet one way or another, either selling assets or usually um, accumulating more and more financial liabilities, and vice versa with a, uh, a sector that is in a financial surplus, they are net savings. They are in a position to accumulate financial assets as households need to do because there will at the end of their life be a period when they are not productive, they're not able to earn money income. Um, or that sector can also be paying down debt and cleaning up its balance sheet. So um, we've gone through these definitions. Um, the neoliberal economists and policymakers don't have this coherent stock flow macroeconomic model. Godley, Minsky, and I would argue Keynes do. And if you look at the papers that the Levy scholars have been writing in the last five, 10 years, they've been uh, very um, diligently developing these uh, stock flow consistent models. Um, instead, what we find is the neoliberals are just monomaniacally obsessed with only one sector flow, the government financial balance. And they completely ignore how that sector balance is interdependent with and, and interrelated with other sector balances. In other words, they're ignoring seven centuries of double entry bookkeeping. And what this means in plain English is the government can't reduce its deficit unless there are other sectors that are willing and able to reduce their net savings position. And so if you have an indebted private sector and is trying to pay down debt, or you have trading partners who are pursuing export-led growth strategies, this is very difficult to do. They will not comply. They will attempt to do things that will thwart the government's ability to, to reduce the, uh, the, the, the fiscal deficit. 
and this will end up often in declining nominal incomes and possibly a debt deflation uh, trajectory. Uh, another way to try and make this plain is we're looking at the cash flows of each sector. So when the domestic private sector pays taxes, that's a cash flow out from households and businesses and into government sector. And when the government spends money, that's cash flow into the domestic private sector. It's an income flow to households and corporations. So there's an interrelationship that we can see here between the government sector financial balance and the domestic private sector financial balance. We can say the same thing about uh, the foreign sector. When the foreign sector buys our exports, there is a cash flow to our domestic private tradable goods sector. And when we buy imports, there's a cash flow out of that sector to the foreign sector. So if we change the financial balance for any one of these sectors, it obviously, if we believe double entry bookkeeping works, has remaining, it has implications for the remaining sectors. So you cannot, in uh, any sensible fashion, analyze these sector balances in isolation. They all have to add up. That's the tyranny of double entry bookkeeping. Okay, so let's make this a little bit more specific about what this means in terms of the interrelationships between the sector financial balances. The domestic private sector financial balance is positive when the government runs a deficit or when the trade account, the current account, is in surplus. And as a general rule, it happens when you have a current account balance greater than the government financial balance, to put it in, in neutral terms. The uh, domestic private sector is deficit spending uh, and therefore heading on its way possibly to financial instability because it's building up debt liabilities when a government runs a surplus and the current account is in deficit, or as a general rule, a more neutral rule, when the current account balance is less than the government financial balance. And this simply flows from this accounting identity that the financial balances have to net to zero, have to sum to zero, and we can rearrange that equation to um, solve for the domestic private sector financial balance. That then can lead us to a diagram that is another way of looking at this. And I spent years and years trying to figure out ways of getting this approach, which again is simply double entry bookkeeping through to people. And sometimes a picture is in fact worth a thousand words. Um, so um, before we go into the diagram, let's again just be clear about these interrelationships. If a nation wants to run a government surplus and domestic private sector also wants to run a financial surplus, also wants to run a net savings position. In other words, both sectors of the economy are trying to reduce debt, they're trying to deleverage. You have to have a current account surplus that is larger than the government surplus. If you reduce the fiscal deficit without any change in the current account balance, you're going to erode the domestic private sector's financial balance. You're going to reduce their net saving or increase their deficit spending. And the only way you can avoid this is if the current account balance magically increases by the same exact amount as the government financial balance. And there's no adjustment mechanism that will ensure that, that we know of. OK, so let me uh, offer you a diagram that might make this a little bit clearer. On the vertical axis, we have the, the government financial balance. So to the north, there's a fiscal surplus. To the south, there's a fiscal deficit. And we're going from fiscal deficit to fiscal surplus as we go up on this line. On the horizontal axis, we have the current account balance. So to the left, we're in a current account deficit. And as we move to the east, uh, we get a current account surplus. And what we'll notice is in the upper north, uh, the upper left-hand corner in the northwest region, when we have the economy with a fiscal surplus and a current account deficit, there are cash flow drains away from households and from businesses. So the domestic private sector in that whole region is deficit spending. The flip side of that is when we have fiscal deficit spending and we have a current account surplus, there are cash flows that are net positive to households and firms and we have a domestic private sector surplus. So these are two unambiguous areas that we can identify in, in this financial balance map. We can draw a 45 degree line where the domestic private sector financial balance is equal to, let's call it these all percentages of GDPs, 0% of GDP, because the fiscal surplus is exactly equal to, the, the fiscal balance is exactly equal to the current account balance. The, the um, fiscal surplus, for example, is extracting as much money from households and firms as the current account surplus is circulating in, okay? 
So we have this financial balance map that allows us to think about this interrelationship between the, the sector financial balances. Minsky, I think, would identify a uh, crisis path, a financial fragility path, as the economy shifts, as, the, as that domestic private sector financial balance moves out further and further, further to the northwest. So as you have a higher fiscal surplus and a higher current account deficit at the same time, you are increasing deficit spending of households and firms, you're increasing the debt on the balance sheet, and you're setting yourself up eventually for an episode of financial instability. The IMF um, would identify a twin deficit crisis path that moves towards the southwest with increasing current account deficits and increasing fiscal deficits, but we can see it's ambiguous how that would affect the uh, domestic private sector. If the fiscal deficit is increasing faster than the current account deficit, and it's larger than the current account deficit, then you have an increasing surplus occurring in the domestic private sector. And the IMF doesn't seem to be very aware of these types of nuances, um, but nevertheless, this is what falls out from this financial balance map. Now, what happens when we introduce a balanced budget constraint, as Germany would love to be able to impose across the Eurozone? We wipe out that whole lower part of the financial balance map. And you will notice we leave a little triangular area off to the northeast where it is possible still for the domestic private sector to run a surplus. But essentially what we are doing by imposing a balanced budget constraint is also imposing a likely deficit spending position on the households and firms in the economy. Unless the current account surplus is very large and increasing at just the right amount. Um, so what happens then if we have a Maastricht criteria of a 3% floor to the fiscal deficit as a percent of GDP? Well, that's the dotted line parallel to the current account deficit horizontal axis. And again, that leaves this triangular area available. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Minsky crisis path, twin deficit path. Okay. And then taking out the, um, the balanced budget uh, balanced fiscal budget, taking out the whole bottom half area of the graph, taking out uh, that whole region where there can possibly be a domestic private sector surplus. And then now the Maastricht criteria, the 3% of GDP floor, again, leaving this smaller triangular area where you can possibly have the domestic private sector net saving, which is what households naturally want to do. And then, um, so what happens then if we have a country like Greece where it's very difficult to get back into a current account surplus position, partly because of the structure of your imports being uh, energy, necessities like energy, food, uh, prescription drugs, and, and so forth. Um, what happens to that room for the domestic private sector to achieve a domestic private surplus? And remember, not only do you have the, this chronic current account deficit problem, which is partly a structural problem, but also you have no influence or very little influence over uh, foreign exchange policy under the Eurozone rules. You're basically consigned to this little triangle where it is possible if the fiscal deficit is larger than the current account deficit, um, but it's still above 3% of GDP, for your private sector to be in a net savings position. So you have really reduced the odds of um, avoiding financial fragility in your private sector when you have imposed a Eurozone type of structure on your economy. Um, the, the other element here is as, if, if we go back. Um, Two minutes, Robert. Was that? Two more minutes. Two minutes, okay. I, I'm not gonna go back then. Um, so the austerity trap has to do with the domestic private sector trying to net save at the same time that the government is trying to reduce its fiscal deficit and this, this is a thwarting or frustrating activity, and you get nominal income and real output declining, as we've seen in Greece. That's the nature of the austerity trap, and that's one way of understanding how to use the financial balance map to uh, get through that. Um, there's three proposals to exit austerity I want to um, suggest here, and you can do this without exiting the euro, which I would think might be appealing to some people. Um, I think we identified what the key problem here is, and we also did it yesterday. We have to somehow regain control over fiscal and monetary policy tools without leaving the euro system. So I'm going to access, I'm going to uh, skip the third one and just mention the two alternative public financing possibilities. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 
so I want to introduce the idea of uh, what I'm going to call a G note, and I want to introduce the idea of reclaiming the banks. Uh, the G note, what I want to suggest here is the government could create a liability that has the following properties. It's a zero interest coupon note. It's a perpetual note, meaning it is never redeemed. It's transferable from one owner to the next. It's denominated in euros, and it's probably denominated in uh, an amount of euros that is easy for people to use in making everyday transactions. So let's call that 50 and 100 uh, euro denominations. And these could be, these G notes could be issued in paper form, or you could have some kind of secured encrypted electronic credit to bank accounts that allows you to issue this G note. You could use this G note to pay government employees, you could use it to pay suppliers to the government. You could use it to pay uh, beneficiaries of transfer payments. And you would agree to accept, as the government agreed to accept this G note at par or face value, as a payment for taxes, thereby creating the demand for these G notes. Uh, so what does this mean? This means you get to say nein danke, or no thanks, to austerity because this G note allows the government to choose whatever fiscal policy position it desires. You could go for full employment, in other words, by issuing these G notes. Preferably, you would do that by financing um, also employment of last resort programs, which we may hear more about, and also by encouraging import competing infrastructure investments so you could do something about your current account deficit without having to go through the pain of wage deflation and income deflation and, and private debt default. This also means, this G note issuance also means the, that euros would be freed up to help pay for imports and also to help service the externally held public debt. Um, it's likely, as we saw in Argentina with this type of parallel currency, that the G notes would be acceptable as a means of payment and a means of settlement between private sector um, entities and private sector transactions. So you could use this to go buy groceries, for example, because households and firms have to pay tax liabilities there would be a demand for these. They would accept them as payment and then turn them into government as tax payments. But in order to do this, you have got to improve your tax enforcement system, and you better have a better distribution of the tax burden so there's a more equal demand for these G notes across the economy. So that's one way out of austerity without exiting the euro. The second way um, is to reclaim the banks. Um, we saw how austerity reduces private income flows. We heard yesterday about how it raises bank loan losses and uh, creates um, the need for bank bailouts. If that's true, um, why don't we just, instead of recapitalizing the banks to socialize these losses, nationalize them? And uh, just as bank loans create deposits, it's true that bank investments and securities create deposits. In other words, banks do not have to gather savings from households before they can make a loan. Um, all they are doing is crediting money uh, to an asset seller's bank account when they buy a security. That's money created by the bank. Um, so if this is true, and this was once understood very well by economists, but somehow has been forgotten or glossed over over the years, um, then there's another way you could uh, gain control of your fiscal policy. The other thing is if central banks are setting an interest rate target, they have to provide all the reserves required to maintain that target at the fixed policy rate. They lose control over the reserve, um, reserves outstanding. Therefore, these banks could not be reserve constrained either. Okay? So uh, what you end up doing is making the banks become the buyers of government debt. They become captive buyers of government debt. Fiscal policy then becomes less financially constrained. Because you've got a zero risk weighting on government debt, that means there's no bank capital constraint here. You can then proceed with the necessary private debt write-offs because these can be identified. You own the bank. You won't have anybody fooling you. And uh, these can be accomplished on the bank books. As you write off the private debt and as you buy more government debt, you make the uh, bank's portfolio um, more credit worthy. It's increasingly weighted toward less risky assets. And you can also begin to direct bank loans towards private sector investment revival purposes. Um, again, to, to do this, you have got to reclaim your democracy. You've got to break your crony capitalism. Um, and otherwise, you're just going to provide more tools for patronage systems to be created here. But these give you two ways of exiting austerity without having to exit the euro. Uh, let, let me conclude then. Um, I think contrary to La Lady Thatcher and the dominant 
neoliberal theology of the last uh, three decades. There is, in fact, an alternative. I've just described two of them for you. In fact, there are probably many of them. And what we now need to do is choose a more life-affirming and regenerative economy over the more suicidal and literally suicidal um, because people who have come to the end of the rope are saying, well, I'm out. Um, this is a suicidal economics of neoliberal austerity that we need to reject. We can remove the binding constraint. The binding constraint is not, if I'm correct, on government finance, but rather on our imagination, our courage, and our willingness to collaborate. And I think another world is possible, one worth living in, but we've got to realize the nature of these neoliberal lies. We've got to take back our power, and we're going to have to work together to build it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Our next speaker is Jörg uh, Bibau, a research associate at Levy Institute and a professor at Skidmore College. Good morning. I'm going to focus my remarks on the issue of fiscal union. I'm going to make the case, thank you, that we need to complement the Euro monetary union by a fiscal union. The current regime is not viable, it's dysfunctional, and will ultimately fail unless we complement the monetary union by fiscal union. I will try to delineate what I consider a minimalistic but functional uh, fiscal union. I call this the Euro Treasury Plan. I begin by uh, highlighting the key regime flaws and talking about uh, crisis mismanagement, recent reforms, then briefly talk about alternative uh, proposals out there before I uh, uh, summarize the, the Euro Treasury Plan. So what are the key flaws? Flaw number one, um, the Euro regime has proved quite incapable of dealing with symmetric shocks, so common shocks. The first example was the uh, global slowdown early 2000s. China started recovering 2002, the US 2004. It took Euroland until the end of 2005. It took a global boom for anything to happen in Euroland. Of course, this was much worse uh, with the big crisis, 2008-9, from which Euroland still has not recovered. Second key flaw, uh, the regime fails preventing asymmetric shocks, so shocks that hit the member states differently. And I particularly have in mind the endogenous variety, because I think the, the Eurozone hasn't really been hit by any proper asymmetric shock. Instead, what happened was that endogenously the regime produced massive divergences and imbalances. The key reason for those divergences was, of course, wage repression in Germany. So as Germany became competitive and super competitive and super, super competitive, everybody else lost competitiveness. So Germany started running ever bigger current account surpluses, everybody else bigger and bigger current account deficits with foreign indebtedness piling up, and uh, this was bound to end in crisis at some point. So the regime did not prevent those kind of divergences. This is flaw number two. Flaw number three, uh, the, the Eurozone proved defenseless when serious financial crises happened. And this really highlights the, the ultimate underlying flaw in the Euro regime, which is the missing Euro Treasury. The Euro regime includes a divorce or features a divorce between the monetary and fiscal authorities. And the problem with that is that it leaves everybody involved very vulnerable. The national treasuries are vulnerable because they don't have a central bank by their side anymore. Essentially, as pointed out yesterday, member states become like colonies. The national central banks, too, are essentially powerless because they're part of the euro system. They're supposed to do what the ECB tells them to do. And unless the ECB allows them to use some emergency liquidity assistance program, they're essentially powerless, too. Now, the ECB itself, and this is a fact far less appreciated, 
the ECB itself is in a very vulnerable position. Why? Well, because it doesn't have a Euro Treasury by its side. And this is an issue when it comes to financial crisis in a monetary union, like the Euro Monetary Union. Because in case the ECB incurs massive losses, the question arises how an ECB bailout might work. Who's going to bail out the ECB? Who's going to hand over bonds to the ECB and what kind of bonds? So the ECB too is in a very vulnerable position and I think it is at least partly aware of that uh, fact and this influences its behavior. Um, so what kind of crisis are we actually dealing with? Well, first of all, a balance of payment crisis. This is flaw number two, those divergences I mentioned. Huge current account imbalances inside the currency union. Accordingly, uh, Germany piled up a huge credit position, whereas the today's crisis countries accumulated a very large uh, debtor position, 100% uh, negative net international investment position. This is, this is really huge. Secondly, of course, uh, as the bubbles burst and uh, loans turned bad, a banking crisis related to the first kind of crisis too. Uh, so a balance of payment and banking crisis are the, are the heart of the matter. Uh, the sovereign debt crisis that we hear most about really is a consequence of those issues. In Greece, perhaps, there was an element of fiscal profli profligacy involved, but as we heard yesterday, in Greece as well, it was mainly private borrowing that drove the boom. Now, this would, all this would be bad enough, but unfortunately the crisis response added, added a growth crisis or a debt deflation, we could say, to the situation, which has made it much worse. So what happened? In the absence of a, a central fiscal backstop, um, the situation became very complicated for the ECB as soon as it became clear that it was not just a liquidity issue, but a solvency issue as well. And both a banking solvency issue and related to that, or as a consequence, it also became a sovereign solvency issue. Now, the ECB is a monetary institution. It's very problematic for a central bank to take on quasi-fiscal functions, especially in the kind of monetary union that we're in, where the central bank is an independent authority, not really held accountable by any political authority. If you have that kind of authority stepping into fiscal territories, this is a, a very dodgy affair. Now, add, and, and I think this is one reason why the ECB itself proved, proved rather reluctant to undertake those steps, which it eventually did undertake. Now, paired to this uh, expansionary fiscal austerity, which was, of course, not as expansionary at all, plus growth-enhancing structural reforms, which, of course, are not growth-enhancing at all, you end up in a major crisis. All this would be bad enough, but then we've undertaken all those uh, regime reforms. We strengthened the so-called Stability and Growth Pact. We added the Fiscal Compact and so on. Now, what does that really change? It makes the situation worse. It's adding constraints to the national uh, finance ministries without doing anything positive. So there is an even greater emphasis on discipline, but all of this is based on the misdiagnosis that finance ministers lack discipline, that fiscal profligacy, profligacy was the source of the problem, which is misdiagnosis. So ultimately, what we then have today is an unworkable regime. And at this point, I can uh, uh, rely on the analysis of the previous speaker who presented the financial balances approach. So essentially what the Eurozone is now trying to do, permanently balancing the public budget. Now, if you have a private sector that basically wants to run a structural surplus, then you have a problem. 
If you think of a closed economy, if the one sector wants to balance its books, the other sector has, has to do so too. So the only way this can work, as Rob pointed out, is by running persistent, sizable current account surpluses. Essentially the German model. This is how Germany did it. Germany balanced its public budget by running up bigger and bigger external surpluses. So essentially relying on the deficit spending of other nations. For the Eurozone to do this, it's complicated. A, because the world economy is too fragile, and B, because the Eurozone is too big. So last, last week, uh, I think the US Treasury sent a very, very clear message to Germany that this is not going to happen. Now, if the Eurozone will not get away with running persistent external surpluses, and the, the public sector is trying to permanently balance its books all the time, then we are basically stuck in permanent recession, the austerity trap. So what to do? Basically, basically I, I think we have three kinds of proposals out there. One category features euro bonds of one kind or another, be it the redemption fund or the blue bonds or the European safe bonds and whatnot. Essentially, what this kind of plan does, it's, it's issuing euro bonds by buying up existing national public debt. The idea is to thereby reduce borrowing costs of those sovereigns. Is that a good idea? Would it help? Probably would. Problem is, this is just addressing one symptom. If it doesn't change anything else in the regime, we're still stuck with a dysfunctional regime. So this is not nearly good enough. The second category, and I include here um, proposals coming out of Brussels, the Four Presidents Report, uh, Tommaso Padua's Giorpa group has a has a somewhat similar uh, proposal out there. What do these proposals do? They want to reform the regime. They, as in particular, they want to add an element of risk sharing, supposed to deal with asymmetric shocks. And they want to introduce more discipline. Now, are these good, good ideas? Certainly the risk sharing element is a, is a very important element. And so far as there are asymmetric shocks in the monetary union, it would be very helpful to have this instrument. The bottom line, however, is this is not nearly going far enough. This element at least goes in the right direction, but it's not doing enough. So the third kind of proposal rejects the austerity dogma and instead proposes to go for stimulus, stimulus focused on public investment. So this includes, for instance, the uh, Marshall Plan by the Deutsche Gewerkschaftsbund, but you may even point out here the European Commission's Europe 2020 strategy, which is also focused on huge volumes of public investment to be undertaken by Eurozone member countries. So, Again, this proposal, something very important in it, namely the stimulus, without recovery, I don't see how the euro can possibly survive. Now, the proposal I'm now gonna, going to make, which I call the Euro Treasury Plan, includes all the positive aspects of the three kinds of previous proposals I've just talked about. But it adds further positive elements, and it does all this in a much more straightforward and simpler way. So the Euro Treasury Plan will fix the regime, it will provide the missing element in the Maastricht regime, it will secure public investment, it will establish low borrowing costs for all member countries, it will offer a much better chance for effective disciplining member states, it's not just a regime fix, but it's also a recovery program and a recovery which is much more symmetric 
so less deflationary for the crisis countries. It is a fiscal union, very importantly, which is not a transfer union. And that, that's a crucial issue because a lot of resistance today against any kind of fiscal union is the fear of a transfer union. So this plan is specifically designed not to be a transfer union. We can't have a fiscal union without a transfer union. We can't have those euro bonds as a side effect, essentially. So how does that work? Very simply, we pool public investment spending at the center, and we have it funded by your treasury securities. Very simple. Let's take the Maastricht criteria. 3% public investment for the Eurozone. And then we let it grow 5% every year. We split it up on the basis of member states' GDP shares. So every member state gets investment grants from the Euro Treasury based on its GDP share for public investment. The Euro Treasury has the power to tax and member states contribute on the basis of their GDP shares. So no transfer union. Both investment grants and interest payments to service the interest on the Euro, Euro Treasury debt are based on countries' GDP shares. <clears throat> member states from now on balance their current budgets, or rather their structural current budgets, because the capital budget is now at the center. The Euro Treasury is the capital budget. Financing the public investment spending by Euro Treasury debt securities. If member states fail, to balance their structural current budgets, the discipline is that they get their investment grants cut. So what does this do? Why is this the missing element? Because it's adding the needed deficit spending at the center. So we will have continuous deficit spending from the center. The Eurozone will not have to rely on perpetual external surpluses to play this role. Instead, we do this by focusing on public investment spending and have it funded by Euro, Euro Treasury securities. So the Euro Treasury does, okay, so this would be um, over time the outcome. The green line is basically the Maastricht 60%, so if we have a perpetual 3% deficit, assume 5% growth, nominal GDP growth, we end up over time at the 60% Maastricht uh, mark. For the member states, if we, assume, if we assume they really were to balance their budgets, public debt ratios at the national level would go to zero. If we go by the 0.5 uh, percent medium-term objectives, which the Commission is working with, we end up with about 10 percent. So notice this is, this is pretty much the U.S. situation, actually, in normal times, so before the crisis. A large debt at the federal level, where it is safe, low debt ratios at the state level, because the states are vulnerable. They should run much lower debt ratios. So the Treasury plan would give us this, and I must emphasize, without the deficit spending from the center, we would never get to these low debt ratios at the national level. We would stay in perpetual recession. So only the deficit spending at the center will enable the currency union to get to this kind of position, which pretty much resembles the US picture. So what does the Euro Treasury do? Essentially three uh, key functions. Number one, secure public investment. This is what uh, is being cut all over Europe at the moment. Finance ministers hold speeches about the beautiful future of Europe, but what do they do? They cut investment spending. Best way to damage Europe's future. 
So the Euro Treasury will secure that we do the public investment that we actually need. And we do it from the center as common public infrastructure investment in Europe, right? The common currency complemented by a common treasury debt funding the common European infrastructure. Secondly, we've, been, we've heard about the banking union yesterday. And the idea was mentioned that we can have a banking union without a fiscal union. I think that doesn't work. A banking union ultimately needs a fiscal backstop. It's not good enough to have just common supervision and the uh, deposit insurance and the resolution mechanism. It was mentioned this would resemble the US. Well, it doesn't because the US also has the US Treasury as the ultimate fiscal backstop to whatever goes wrong in the financial system. Thirdly, we would anchor stabilization policy at the national level. This hasn't worked so far because the nation, the member states have too high public debt and very quickly we're not able or we're put under pressure not to allow the automatic stabilizers to function freely. So what the Euro Treasury does is by enabling the member states to really reduce the debt ratios to very low levels, around 10% in the long run, they would have the fiscal space to then actually let the fiscal stabilizers, which are huge in Europe, to let them work freely at the national level. In major crises, we could add some more stabilization from the center, but I think in normal recessions, this might actually be good enough. Also, I earlier mentioned the issue of asymmetric shocks, the issue of uh, mutual insurance, we could easily use the Euro Treasury scheme and add this element to it, right? So the idea here is not persistent transfers. This would be a transfer union, and this scheme is about a fiscal union which is not a transfer union. So the risk-sharing element has to be designed in such a way that those transfers are always temporary and, in principle, would balance out over time. So this could be part of the scheme as well. Okay, so the regime fix, which is adding those elements which the Euro regime is currently missing. This is one fundamental issue. The other one is how to get the recovery. And the nice thing about this plan is that the transition includes a recovery boost. Partly directly because public investment, which is severely depressed at the moment, in Germany it's about 1.5%. I'm not kidding you. So obviously there would be a big increase. Secondly, member states would no longer have to balance their structural overall budget, but their structural current budget. So cutting out public investment, which is now undertaken and funded at the center. So there would be stimulus coming through that change as well. Thirdly, there would be indirect stimulus as soon as the markets realize that national public debts are set on a declining trend, interest rate spreads should come down massively and support the recovery too. And of course, now with the Euro Treasury debt, we have a common benchmark term structure, so interest rates across the union should all be marked against this common benchmark, so we get rid of the uh, uh, issues that we currently have that borrowers in uh, Greece and Spain and Portugal pay very uh, much higher rates than borrowers in Germany. Uh, Germany itself would of course see a massive stimulus and this factor is actually important. It may seem counterintuitive at first, but this is important in order to allow a more symmetric rebalancing. It would give us higher inflation and more domestic demand growth in Germany, which is part of the needed rebalancing within the currency union. 
The ECB, by the way, should be extremely happy about this because it would give the ECB a chance to get clean again. I said earlier, it's a very dodgy situation for the ECB to buy national debts. The Federal Reserve doesn't do that. The Fed buys federal debts. And this is what the ECB would henceforth do. They would only deal in Euro Treasury securities. They would no longer touch national debts. So the only thing that the plan does not address is the debt legacies. And you might say, well, that's an important issue. I agree, that is an important issue. But as I said, the Euro Treasury plan is a fiscal union which is not a transfer union, so it cannot deal with this issue. My hope would be that once we get a recovery, once spirits lighten up, perhaps we would also see more solidarity and more created, creative ideas of how to deal with the debt legacies as a side effect. So let me sum up. The current regime is flawed, dysfunctional. The euro is not on a viable track. We need to add the fiscal treasury. It would, the treasury is the missing element, I argued. It's uh, securing public investment in Europe. It's the needed backstop for the banking union. And it enables the automatic stabilizers at the national level to function freely. Also, it's a recovery program because it would give more stimulus and it would allow a more symmetric rebalancing. The essential point is that we re-establish at the center the link between the fiscal and monetary authorities, which is currently missing, which is ultimately the key vulnerability of the Maastricht regime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bibo. Now we, will, we have time to take perhaps a couple of questions. If there's anyone, the erudition uh, you in the questions can be neither English or Greek. Yes. Hi, I want to ask Robert about the gene node. Uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, Gresham's law states that if you have a dual currency system, bad money is going to float good money is going to be hoarded. Do you think the G note can work without an expiration date? It's, it, first of all, it's not a dual currency in the sense that it's a euro denominated G note that we're talking about. Um, the place where there may be problems is the initial acceptance of it in private transactions, but as I said, in Argentina where we had an even dodgier situation it did uh, very quickly go into circulation, basically, because you had no other alternative. You needed to make money. You needed to pay your bills. You took it, and you accepted it, and you took the chance that it would do the trick. Um, the other issue that will come up is that it will not likely be accepted as a means of settlement or payment by um, exporters to Greece. So there could be a discount element that could show up in that sense, but to the extent the uh, Treasury is accepting it as a means of payment at par in euros for taxes, that should create a, a bid, a floor, if you will, that assures that you don't get a dual currency situation arising in Gresham's law applying to that. Okay? Next question? Yes, and then one and two, and the thing will be done. Yes, you. Hello. Uh, my name is Paavo Teter and I'm a financial journalist from Finland and I have a question about uh, sectoral balances. In, in Finland, there's a very curious case. We're running a current account deficit, but at the same time the government is constantly angry about both uh, government uh, deficits and uh, domestic private sector deficits, which is patently absurd. So I'm just wondering, why do you think it's so difficult for people to grasp this? I know you both know the excellent Paul Samuelson quote about there being an element of truth in the superstition uh, 
that the budget must be balanced at all times because it, if you take that away, you take away one of the bulwarks of you know, civilized society, it will lead to anarchistic chaos and inefficiency. Do you think it's that, or do you think it's genuine ignorance? Thanks. I, I think it's both. I think, uh, as I said, there is a fatal conceit behind, um, that is the fatal flaw, um, which is this faith-based economics in relative prices adjusting and taking care of everything. So we don't, you don't see, we, ha we have all kinds of debt sustainability equations that we can run for the public sector. We also have them for the external sector. Do you ever see anything of that sort for household sectors or business sectors of economies? No, and yet we've gone through two decades of repeated private sector debt distress in near debt deflation, if not, in fact, on the verge of outright debt deflation in the Eurozone. Um, so there is an ideological blinder here. There is a theological blinder here, and this is what we have to pierce using nothing more elaborate than seven centuries of double entry bookkeeping, which the Italians developed, okay? And we, I run into this problem, you have to just keep hammering at home. This is the math, this is the algebra, this is the diagram. Where do you disagree? And they just try to ignore it. But eventually there will be enough people to understand this, you can't ignore it. Just to add to that, um ideology, brainwashing. Uh, I would add that it's in a way a fairly recent phenomenon because until a few years ago uh, Germany had it in its constitution the golden rule of public finance which is essentially what I what the plan is about finance public investment by debt balance the current budget. So this was in the German constitution until 2009 uh, so it's very recent that Germany really got mad about this idea of balancing the budget. It was accepted not so long ago that public investment would be debt financed. And the irony is that the, the more crazy Germany got this uh, about this idea of balancing the budget, which really, after German unification, German finance ministers increasingly really turned mad about this issue, the, the real irony is that over this period, investment in Germany declined more and more. Both public investment, which in the 80s was about 4.5% of GDP, now it's 1.5%. Like in the 2000s, Germany had negative net public investment. Wow. How can you do that? How can you talk about your grandchildren and worry about debt when you let your public infrastructure rot? What kind of policy is that? But not just public investment declined over time, in line with it, private investment too. So Germany is celebrating balancing its public budget, but what does it really have to show for it? Meager productivity growth, the lowest investment rates in its history, both public and private, it's a disaster. But somehow this ideology is blinding or clogging the minds of these politicians, that they celebrate balancing the public budget as if it were the only thing that mattered. It's crazy. I'll, I'll add one more thing that went on in my lifetime. What we've seen is macroeconomics become aggregated microeconomics. So economists are no longer trained to think in terms of the big picture and the interrelationships of the different pieces of the big picture. Okay, so we've basically created a macroeconomics based on aggregating microeconomics. We've trained everybody to think about it that way, and we've wiped out a whole generation of people, and we've killed off a whole generation of economists that used to be able to think of, the, of these problems in, this, in these terms very easily, very simply. I mean, this, this is stuff that was in introductory textbooks 30 years ago. Hi, hello, Alex Gutlis. I mean, just to bring the conversation back from Finland and Germany to Greece, I mean, uh, a couple of solutions that you have offered is like a 3% GDP transfer to Greece or investment or nationalizing the banks. Well, Greece was receiving over 3% uh, of transfers from the European Union on average over the past 30 years. It also had uh, state-owned banks, like Agricultural Bank of Greece. It went bankrupt. It was actually bankrupt before the crisis hit. Uh, 
he was, he was giving billions of loans to uh, not only farmers, but other people that never paid a cent, because obviously these were politically driven loans to, uh, to buy votes. So some would say that Greece is a failed state. I mean, do you think your solutions uh, work, uh, could work now in Greece, or perhaps has Greece got to do other things first before receiving 3% transfers or nationalizing its banks? Yeah, remember, I stipulated with the two um, alternative financial solutions that I offered that you have got to reclaim your democracy before you do this. Otherwise, you're just reproducing the crony capitalism that's created misallocation problems all along the way. Now, do I know exactly what the structure of corporate governance should look for, look like for a publicly owned uh, nationalized bank? I don't. I'm not an expert in that, but I'm sure somebody can figure it out. I'm sure the incentive structures can be created, the oversight can be created, but you've got to fight back for your democracy. Just like in the United States, it's been captured by an elite. And if you do not fight for that first, these solutions will not work. That I, let me, that I proposed. Sorry. Uh, let me uh, clarify this. You refer to transfers to Greece. You refer to the EU budget. The Euro Treasury is separate from the EU budget. The EU budget is about transfers. Member states pay taxes into the budget, and this is redistributed. The Euro Treasury is not of that kind, right? I emphasized it's based on country's GDP share. The Treasury issues debts and hands out investment grants to the member states based on GDP share, so it's not a transfer union. Um, It's, it's a plan, I emphasize, it's not, it's not specifically targeting Greece. It's about the Eurozone. It's the missing element in the Maastricht regime. It would help Greece and it would set the Euro on a viable path. To help Greece specifically, you probably have to design complementary programs targeting the situation in Greece. My plan is about the Eurozone as a whole and it's not transferred. And uh, at this point, we will conclude our session. We, I'd like to thank our speakers and our audience, and uh, thank you very much.